there are, I'd have to say there are two reasons species become extinct. They're what we might call the proximate reason, what happened right now, that caused there to be no more of that species. And then there's the ultimate reason, what really happened that caused this whole process. So the proximate reason might be something like, um, well, hunters shot the last one and now there aren't any more, or we hunted them, or we fished them into extinction, or something like that. Um, but the ultimate reason really is the organism that was under some kind of stress was unable to adjust to that stress in the amount of time that it had. And that's why it went extinct. So ultimately, there wasn't enough time to adjust. So in the case of a bacteria, uh, that would be 20 minutes because a bacteria can reproduce in 20 minutes and produce the next generation. So if there is a mutation for surviving that stress, <clears throat> give them 20 minutes and they'll have some resistant survivors. Um, but in the case of uh, humans, well, we need 15 to 20 years to produce the next generation. Now, the catch is that for any species to adapt, it might be a hundred generations. Well, that's tomorrow for bacteria. It's maybe later today. For us, that's uh, 1,500 years from now. Um, so we aren't adapting very fast, and they adapt, bacteria adapt very fast. So there's a difference in, in, in how much time we have to respond. So any species that's gone extinct probably didn't have enough time to respond given how fast it could produce the next generation. So uh, as a consequence, big things go extinct fast and small things don't go extinct as fast. Um, and some people might not be satisfied with that answer as like the ultimate reason things go extinct, but ultimately that's the reason. They couldn't adapt fast enough. Well, after World War II, <clears throat> there was suddenly available to farmers um, pesticides, synthetic pesticides and synthetic herbicides. This was also true in the medical world. Suddenly, there were all of these medicines that, that we created as a result of the medical care that we had to provide to injured soldiers. So a lot of breakthroughs occurred. Uh, in World War II, but after World War II, all of those things became available to the general public. So farmers got pesticides and farmers got fertilizers. All this leftover nitrogen from making bombs was now available for making plants. And so we went into commercial agriculture at a much different rate, from a different angle. We could do things on a bigger scale. And so we started applying pesticides in particular on everything. And DDT was the number one pesticide applied immediately after World War II. Uh, and so, and it was a miracle drug essentially for farmers. So <clears throat> you spray that stuff and your pests go away for five years or so. And then they all come back. Uh, and that's okay, we'll keep using the, but the DDT, but it, it was less effective and then less effective and then it really didn't work after seven to eight years. So by the early 1950s, DDT didn't work anymore. And that was because the pests that we were trying to eradicate, we, we never actually eradicate. No pest has ever been eradicated. Um, we can reduce the numbers dramatically, but we can't get every last one. And if you don't get every last one, then you've got a problem because those few that don't die probably didn't die for a reason. They probably didn't die because, well, that chemical doesn't kill them. And so they reproduced because they were, they had the whole agricultural field to themselves now and they grew rapidly and in vast numbers and all of their offspring had the same basic characteristics the parents did. Parents were resistant, the offspring are resistant and there you go, we've got resistant pests. And we managed to do this several hundred times over the next couple of decades and prove to ourselves that yes, it works every single time. Um, and all of this started it was a bit of a snowball rolling downhill. It started immediately after World War II and has just gained speed ever since. The response to basically failing with DDT was, should have been, oh, that doesn't really work <clears throat> because we only get a couple of years without the pests and then they're back and they're stronger than ever. 
But instead, our decision was, well, let's try to make better chemicals. Well, there aren't too many chemicals that are better than DDT at killing insects. It's, it's probably the best chemical that was ever made. <clears throat> but our response was, we can make it better and stronger. And so we did. We went after bigger and better chemicals. Then the results were the same. <clears throat> The difference, uh, perhaps, though, was that we changed the intensity of our attack. And we quickly found out the intensity doesn't make any difference. Well, it makes a difference in a sense. It speeds it up. So <clears throat> where we can use chemicals to kill some of the pests or most of the pests, if you increase the intensity, you can get almost all. But that just means that the ones that are left behind are totally resistant and their offspring will be totally resistant and then you speed up the process of creating a resistant pest. And so that's what agriculture essentially got into was this economies of scale where we go into big monocultures, gigantic fields and spray uniform application of chemicals on those fields and if there is any mutation for resistance out there, by golly, you will find it. Um, and it will take over. Um, in the past, with family farms with small plots, and you know they might have 100 acres in 10, 20 different crops, instead of having 10,000 acres in a single crop, we just, we just were never going to see that kind of response. But when we went to these big, big, modern, agricultural, large-scale uh, approaches to growing food, we saw pesticide resistance almost overnight. Well, <clears throat> going to large-scale farms is driven by a number of different factors, uh, economics in particular. Um, Small-scale farms typically were family farms. They were growing food for themselves. If they had leftover food, they could sell it, they could barter it, they could use it to generate a little cash for the family. But mostly they were feeding themselves and then hoping for some extra. Um, <clears throat> a number of changes took place the John Deere plow was a good example. Uh, the John Deere plow allowed the Midwest to be plowed. Uh, prior to that, it couldn't be because the plow cut deep enough to actually get down to the soil, and the John Deere plow could be credited with transforming the Midwest. And then large, large expanses of farms could be made uh, that were bigger than the old family farm. Uh, and that just, that just entails a whole different approach toward agriculture. Uh, if there's large expanses of farm, they have to be treated differently. It's one crop. It, uh, it's growing all at the same time. We want more uniformity of the crop so we can harvest once, not twice. So we get it all the first pass. We don't leave some on the ground. So that um, if we have a pest problem, we can spray the whole field and not, and not do the old labor-intensive process of walking through the field and spraying here and there and doing that every week. Just treat everything very uniformly. And in fact, that encourages pest resistance, but at the same time, it's efficient and uh, can be more cost effective. It often takes large pieces of machinery too. So as we move toward that system, we encouraged commercial farming that could afford big pieces of equipment, that could afford the repairs and the diesel to run these machines and, and could grow things that didn't necessarily make lots and lots of money but there's enough acreage out there so that it in fact made a lot of money because of the acreage, but it couldn't work well on a small scale. So a number of different economic factors sort of playing together until we end up with the giant farms that we have today that really are focused on commodity crops rather than food crops, but um, giant monocultures of those crops. Using the word intense farming is a good word because intensity is what has really changed over the years. We are attempting to, to force the land to produce more and more food. We're using fertilizer to assist that. We're, we're attempting to eliminate losses due to pests. We're trying to get more than ever before out of the land and intensity is really the approach. And then the rest of that approach is um, uh, 
large scale approaches, uh, uniform crops, uniform genetic uh, variation in the crops and that sort of thing. Um, the intensity, uh, increasing intensity um, also means, um, well, it's this use uniformity process, this problem of uniformity. To do this in an economical way, we can't have patches of farm. We can't have uh, a little bit here and a little bit there and it's scattered. It needs to be one big, big farm. And to do that, we need to eliminate all of the other uh, wildlands around and convert that to big patches so that we can run tractors and straight lines and, and, and do this very quickly and easily and efficiently. And so we push back the wildlands and we convert our agricultural fields to a, to a single crop. Um, and the result is a farm that has one species growing on it, the crop. We don't want anything else out there. We want no bugs, no birds, no, we don't want anything. We want to be able to control every aspect of the growth of that one crop. And everything else interferes with that, in essence. And so that's essentially why modern farming has pushed biodiversity, wildlands, anything um, that isn't directly involved in producing that crop away from the farm. We actually could have used the word farm ecosystem in the past. I don't think you can do that now. On the small family farm with multiple crops, small patches of multiple crops, you can use that word. There are birds and butterflies and bees and insects, and, and they feed they are different pests eating different foods, but then there are different predators eating those different pests, and, and the whole uh, landscape supports that biodiversity. Now, it's not native biodiversity by any means, but it is farm biodiversity, and we've moved c completely away from that. So there is zero biodiversity. Monoculture means one crop, one species of crop, being grown at a time. So we have agriculture, but we have agriculture of one crop that is a monoculture. As uh, compared, to, compared to, say, a polyculture, which would be growing multiple species at one time. Now, if we go back to the Native Americans, they used to grow what was called the three sisters. That was corn, beans, and squash. And there was a very good reason for growing those particular species. Corn produced starch. Uh, beans enriched the soil, plus produced uh, beans that could be eaten, which actually is a very good complementary food to corn. And, uh, and the squash plants produced another kind of food, plus the big leaves on the squash plant shaded the ground. And together, they were a relatively healthy farming system. But growing more than one crop on a piece of land, intercropping, for example, where there's alternating rows of crop, is hard to um, harvest. Um, it's not as efficient. It's better for the soil, but you know, if we've got fertilizers and we've got water, then do we really need to worry about the soil as much? So in, <clears throat> in an effort to grow vast quantities of some commodity crop like corn, uh, the monoculture is really the most efficient way to do it in the short run. And it takes very large machinery, very large expensive machinery. And expensive machinery is not typically set up to handle multiple crops in a field. Um, <clears throat> and so we have gone in literally every part of commercialized agriculture toward the monoculture approach. And it has pushed out a lot of what we used to call cash crops, uh, the crops that families would grow for themselves and maybe put in local markets, uh, crops that some people might actually call food because most of the commodity crops are not food directly. They have to be processed and to become food. Um, but that is the way modern agriculture has gone. The foundation for agriculture is soil. And um, if there's one thing that farmers 
who are in touch with the land are concerned about, it is soil. Um, in, in fact, there are a number of farmers who are, they might call themselves organic, they might call themselves all natural farming. Uh, they don't even think of themselves as being farmers or ranchers. They think of themselves as being growers of grass. Because if you grow healthy grass, you can grow healthy cows. But you can only grow healthy grass if you have healthy soil. And so really what they're saying is, I care about the soil, and then everything else falls in place. The chemicals that we use are hostile to, to the soil community. And that is, per tablespoon of soil, millions of bacteria hundreds of different species of fungi, nematodes, um, invertebrates, um, you name it. A, a healthy soil has about 50% air space and might be only 20, 25% actually inorganic, like dirt, what we would think of as dirt, sand and silt and clay. About a quarter of it is organic material that's breaking down. It's dead stuff that's breaking down. And the bacteria and fungi are responsible for that. And then a tremendous amount of biological activity. And then a whole bunch of airspace. So if we think of, of good, healthy, living soil, there's not a whole lot of dirt in there. When we look at farm soil of today, we see dirt. Uh, there's almost no biological activity at all. There's very little organic material. We're seeing dirt. Um, and so that's the big difference between healthy soil and sort of modern farm soil is that it's lacking the living component and the living component is really what helps plants grow better than anything else. Plus it enriches the soil and keeps the soil healthy. And the chemicals we use from fumigants to uh, insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, they all, they, and fertilizers by the way, fertilizers are almost always salts and the salts are toxic uh, <clears throat> to the things living in the soil. All of these things have fairly negative effect and some way more than others, but the end result is when we plow the soil, we, we, we make dark soil into light soil, we make uh, um, cool soil into hot soil, we expose it to the sunlight. When we do all of those things to soil, we're, 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 we're making life extraordinarily hostile to bacteria and fungi, and then we're using lots of chemicals on top of that. Um, literally, we kill the soil, and we're paying the consequences of that now, I think, in agriculture. No-till farming is farming that doesn't turn the soil upside down. Um, it's a very hard habit for farmers to break, because farmers, I think, really do love plowing. Um, they get a great deal of, of sort of, uh, it's almost like artistic expression. They get a, a great deal of satisfaction from seeing a straight plow line and a field that's just clean and pretty and ready for crops. I know for, from experience that farmers love this, to see that. They think that's a good look. No-till farming is hard because it's telling the farmers, stop doing that. Um, it's bad for the soil. It'll destroy the soil. It has destroyed the soil. And if you want to make your soil healthy again, you have to stop turning the soil upside down every year, two, three times a year, and let it do what soil does, which is stay in one place and be home to millions and millions of living organisms that don't thrive on soil that gets turned upside down every year. Uh, it's being used more and more. It's very good for soil, but it's a very hard habit for farmers to break, especially in the world of annual crops where every year the, the field has to be prepared for the next crop. They are a problem for growing, that is true. Uh, herbicide resistant weeds are essentially the same as herbicide resistant insects. Uh, they are plants that have been hit with some kind of chemical stress and there was a mutation for some kind of resistance or tolerance to that stress. Um, the plant maybe didn't take up the chemical, it wasn't affected by the chemical, maybe it could break down the chemical. Uh, there are any number of ways how it can get around the toxic effects of an herbicide, but if there is uh, some genetic variation that allows the plant to survive that threat and continue to produce seeds, 
those are resistant plants and they will take over because it will either take another chemical or another approach to control them because that one chemical is not going to work. I don't know how many chemicals are sprayed on our crops these days. I will say that with the advent of biotechnology in, in crop plants, particularly in uh, a Roundup Ready plants, for example, <clears throat> Monsanto created Roundup Ready crops, uh, um, about a half dozen of them, all of them commodity crops. And that meant that, um, that Roundup didn't have to be, the farmer didn't have to spray Roundup on the crop prior to planting farmer could plant the crop, wait until it emerged, and the weeds emerged, and then hit the weeds with Roundup, didn't have to worry about the crop. The problem with that was that every farmer that was using Roundup Ready seeds w went from using perhaps several herbicides, depending on what the problem was, to one herbicide, because that one herbicide killed everything but the, the crop plant. And as a result, within just a very short uh, uh, amount of time, we had resistant s species uh, to Roundup. And there are currently, th uh, last I looked, 32 different species in the world that are resistant to Roundup and about 24 of them in the United States. But if even one plant in a field is resistant to Roundup, then that means there's one plant running wild. We have reduced the number to, by, by using genetically modified crops, and it has made the problem, if anything, a little bit worse just because of that dependency on that one chemical. Um, we have, but I can say that there are uh, almost 30 different classes of herbicides, and there are about 30 classes of insecticides. Uh, one of the problems with herbicides that we're now encountering is that there hasn't been a new one put on the market in over 20 years. So we have what we have in the arsenal, and it's very likely the arsenal is going to be depleted. The commercial, uh, uh, the commercial answer to organic farming is that you can't feed the world on organic food. That's always been the claim. Um, of course, no one's tried, so we don't know that. Um, but the argument is that you can't grow organic foods on the same scale. This, this economies of scale issue that has affected modern farming cannot be applied to organic farming. And there's a good reason for that. Organic farming must stay small because as soon as you go to large scale, you have to become dependent on technology. That's, they just go hand in hand. So <clears throat> organic farming cannot be a kind of farming that is applied in the same way that modern farming is. It would have to be done in a different way. So from the perspective of big farming corporations and the commercial approach toward farming, organic farming is not something they want to do because they can't envision how it would occur. So does that mean it, it couldn't feed the world? I don't think that that is a sufficient response to that question that we can't apply it at the same level of scale, especially when we grow 100 million acres of corn, but we don't actually eat corn. Uh, humans eat very little corn. Now, our cars are eating about half that corn, and cows and pigs and chickens and now fish are eating about half that corn. And it's going into about 10,000 different industrial applications, the corn is. We're not eating that corn. <clears throat> so one could argue that we really don't need to grow corn on 100 million acres. It's not necessary. We could be growing organic food on those acres, and that would actually be an interesting conversation for a, someone to have with the commercial uh, agriculture industry with uh, someone from the commercial food industry, um, but I haven't heard anyone having that conversation yet. I, I, I think feeding seven billion people is a problem, but I'm not ready to rule out the use of organic farming to do that. I think we have to rethink our approach toward farming and what and the reasons we are the reasons we farm what we farm. Do we need 100 million acres of corn? No, we do not. Um, do we need to slaughter 7 billion cows a year for hamburgers? I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think no, and that's why we're growing the corn. So 
there are some other questions involved with answering that, that particular question about organic farming. The lifespan of any new insecticide, herbicide, pesticide in general is probably in the neighborhood of five to seven years, generally. If it is widely adopted and widely used, that is it's sprayed intensively over large acreages, it will fail fairly quickly. And that's because if there is a huge infestation of insects, then there is probably a great deal of genetic variation out there and those toxins are going to find mutations for resistance. The problem is that it takes somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 years to get new products on the market. <clears throat> now, the agrochemical industry knows that and they've already got the next generation of chemicals. They're working on it, they're working on it. Um, and it takes, however, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 plus million dollars to bring a, a product from the planning stage to the market uh, and as I say, in about eight to 10 years. So um, <clears throat> the problem is resistance. If I really want to get down to, as we talked about earlier, uh, the ultimate reason things go extinct is that there is a, the ultimate reason that, uh, that chemicals fail to be effective for any length of time is this. The ultimate reason rather than the proximate reason is this. Chemicals are a technological tool, a non-living, non-adapting tool for dealing with a very specific problem. Unfortunately, that problem is embedded in a biological system. And the biological system will adapt to any stress. The technological tool is a stress. If we take a biological system such as a bug and we attempt to kill it with a technological tool such as a chemical, the bug will adapt to the chemical very quickly and the chemical is incapable of adapting in response. The chemical becomes ineffective and fails, the bug goes on living. And this is the ultimate reason why uh, we cannot win the war against living things using non-living tools. Not unless we want to maybe go to the extreme and just sort of like firebomb our fields and eliminate every living thing altogether. Uh, and unless we are willing to take that step, we will fail every single time we apply a technological tool to a biological system. It will adapt to that tool and then we'll be faced with coming up with a new tool. The answer to the question as to why we use by far the most chemicals in agriculture is because I think we are the center of the industrialization of agriculture. And so we are the, in, the center of the use of all technology for growing food. So we, we've led the charge. We're developing the latest breakthroughs, if you want to call them that. A number of other companies, countries that do a great deal of agriculture have just shied away from being that, that uh, intensively committed to using technology to grow food, um, in part because they can see the writing on the wall. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not hard to read that this is a pathway that leads absolutely nowhere um, in, with the concept of uh, the Red Queen, we are running and running as fast as we can. We're not getting anywhere, but if we want to, if we want to be in this race, we have to run and we have to run as fast as we can. Now, one of the things about the modern agriculture is this, we are never leading this race. We're always, always running catch up. We're always trying to catch up because when we're being, when we have a problem with a crop pest, the, that, that, pest exists already. The problem is already there. We now have to deal with it. We go into crisis mode to deal with it. <clears throat> we are never ahead of the game. And in fact, the way biology works, we can never be ahead of it. At, at best, we can sort of run even, and we're never going to get ahead. If we recognize that, then we recognize we have to get out of this chemical treadmill. But the United States so far has run 
just as fast as possible in the opposite direction. We are, we are dead set on winning a race that does not have a finish line. There is no winning this race. It's a race you run, but it's not a race you can win. It is absolutely a race you can lose, though. If you don't run, you lose. So once we get on that chemical treadmill, we have no real alternative except to just keep running, unless we get out of it entirely. As we've gotten into greater and greater use of pesticides, we've created industries that will supply us with those pesticides. Um, and um, they are as responsive as, as any uh, company will be to the market. If the market wants more, they absolutely will provide it. They're going to charge us for it, no question about it, because their R&D costs are astronomical these days. And so they have to patent those products and they have to sell them at a premium. <clears throat> This is one of the real problems with uh, agrochemicals, and that is they are not medicines for the farm. With a medicine, um, we, we can take a new medicine that's got a patent, and it's gonna cost us some money, but when the patent expires, anybody can make it, and it becomes a generic medicine, and now we can get it for very little cost. <clears throat> that's because we're not building up resistance, and, uh, and what we're treating is not building up a resistance to those, those chemicals. When we use far, farm chemicals, we are immediately getting a pushback from the natural world, and the resistance builds very quickly, and then it isn't that we lose the patent on the product, we lose effectiveness of the product. So it doesn't do any good if it ever goes to a generic status. We don't have any use for it. Uh, one of the examples I've given is, um, is uh, flea medicine for dogs. I won't name any names, but when the first flea medicines came out, they had, they had chemical X in them. And after a while, chemical X didn't kill fleas anymore, and we know why that is, because fleas became resistant to chemical X. And so the next generation of flea medicine said, we're going to put two chemicals that kill fleas and now twice the power. Well, that's not exactly true, because the first one doesn't work anymore, and so really there's just one work, but now we're applying two chemicals to our dogs, knowing that one of them doesn't work. And then when that one doesn't work, they've now come out with, uh, there's one called Tritac, Triple Attack. Uh, it's got three chemicals, except two of them don't work. So uh, in the case of, of agricultural chemicals, we never get in the situation where we can use generic medicines. We, we can't even do what they're doing now in genetically modified crops where they're stacking different um, um, traits. Some of those don't work anymore. Um, and so we're stuck. Um, on this treadmill because we've bought into the idea that the next chemical will be better than the previous one and will somehow not behave like the previous one, but they all be, as far as the biological world is concerned, it's just another chemical. It's just another little obstacle that has to be overcome and there's nothing the biological world does better than overcome obstacles like stresses and insects and bacteria and tiny things like that are better at it than anybody. They can do it in a matter of weeks to months to a short number of years. So we, as a culture, the United States, have bought into a process that <laughs> is essentially a dead-end process. And we have so far been unwilling to give in to the the fact that um, this can't proceed indefinitely. There are other co countries that have the same problems we have. <clears throat> if, if you went to Uzbekistan, 90% of their economy is based on cotton. They have horrible problems with cotton. Everybody in the country works in cotton, on cotton, with cotton in some way. Um, in India and in China, they have gigantic problems with farms that use lots of pesticides. And in fact, they've discovered uh, <coughs> in some cases that when they're using genetically mod modified crops that are like, like Roundup Ready sorts of things that, are, that, uh, that are, can withstand the chemicals, within a couple of years, they're using even more chemicals than they were before. Um, the, the United States is just doing this on a bigger scale, and 
on greater acreage is for very specific things. So our use of chemicals uh, spans all crops, but is particularly focused on cotton, which uses 25% of all the chemicals we use, but we only grow cotton on 5% of the land. Um, and then vast amounts on the soybeans, wheat, corn, canola, um, and other commodity crops that take up vast acreages in our country. Sad but true. Well, China and India are still largely based on rural economies. Um, they don't have highly mechanized um, <coughs> commercial, they don't, they don't have commercial agriculture like we do. China has a government commercial agriculture, government sponsored. Uh, India, I don't think has, they probably do, but it's, but most of the countries are still rural and doing things in very traditional ways. They're slowly moving toward the American model, but, but we went fast and in a big way. And we pushed out the small farmer. We did it, almost, no, I wouldn't say intentionally, but yeah. Uh, by subsidizing crops, particularly commodity crops, we push the small farmer right out of the business. Yes, the, the words total production value are very important here because the very large farms are producing the commodity crops <coughs> and small farms don't produce those crops. They, they probably quite often are focused on actual food um, commodity crops are not food, but if we look at total production, large farms produce by far the vast majority of the production in this country. Um, is it bad? Well, if you want corn, uh, I think that's the most efficient way to grow corn. It's the most destructive, the most damaging to the environment. Uh, but if you want, if that's your goal, then that's probably the way to do it. If your goal is to produce healthy food for your citizens, that is probably the opposite of the right way to do it. Um, the food production, things that we actually put in our mouths, is not grown in the Midwest. That food is grown in California and it's grown in uh, particular areas that are suitable to those kinds of crops. And they are done on fairly large farms, but not in nearly anything that compares to commodity crop farming. So <laughs> the question is difficult to answer. Um, the, our goal in, in, in having super large farms is to produce super large quantities of things that we don't really eat. But that's our farm production. It, 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 you might argue that that's misplaced effort if your goal is to produce food, but it isn't misplaced effort if you're trying to produce fiber, for instance, that's cheap. I will also say though that um, very large farms um, take up almost all of the subsidies for, for, from the farm, the U.S. Farm Bill. Uh, small farms get almost none. So the, that production is highly subsidized in fact, corn prices are guaranteed. So if you're, if you're growing watermelons and you have no idea what the weather's going to be like and what the crop's going to be like, but you know that if you grow corn, you won't make as much money as a good watermelon year, but it's guaranteed, that's not a hard decision for a farmer. Um, you might, won't make as much money, but by golly, you can, you can plan for the future because you know what the budget's going to be, and you can't do that with... Um, with food crops, cash crops. And by subsidizing the food for the animals, we are subsidizing the animals. And so, uh, you know, if, if the consumer wants low cost food, this is how you get low, this is how you keep costs low. But I, I would also caution that if you use, uh, to get low cost food, we have a tendency to produce somewhat low cost quality food at the same time. So to keep food costs low, uh, something has to give there. Either the quality of that food goes down or you can't have as much of it. Um, and we want both. So I think the, the direction we're going is subsidizing crops that keeps food prices down, but it also is now suppressing the quality of that food.
and um, that's the that's the end result. And something that I'm very concerned about is is this trade-off between quantity and quality. We have absolutely gone for quantity, and I think um, the loss that we are now experiencing and potentially suffering from is that we are eating low-quality food, and that's having uh, health effects on the human population. I'm interested in, and will be interested in the future in writing more about um, the long-term effects of our agricultural practices on ecosystem health. So I've started out by talking about pesticides and um, why that, that that entire process is a dead-end process and is not going to get us what we want. We have to rethink how we go about farming. Um, I'm now thinking about how the health of the individual is tightly interwoven with the health of the surrounding environment. And since we as individuals are little ecosystems, we have uh, organisms living inside of us, and we are responsible for their health, but they're also responsible for our health. And we keep them healthy by feeding them good food, healthy food. They keep us healthy, and in, in that way, we can now live in an environment and not suffer from that environment. We can defend ourselves from that environment. But the point I wanna make in that is that the, the interactions between the outside and the inside are complementary. Um, for us to be healthy on the inside, we must be in a, a healthy environment. If we're not in a healthy environment, we can't be healthy on the inside because our health depends on a healthy external environment. So in that sense, what we are doing to the environment is uh, unethical, some might say immoral. If we are destroying our surrounding environment, then we are destroying our capacity for living in a healthy life. <clears throat> and that's due to the fact that we are a system, we aren't a, a thing. We don't eat a food, and that food then feeds our body, and that's all there is to it. That food feeds an entire ecosystem. And we need a diversity of foods and a diversity of good, high-quality foods to feed a diverse, high-quality, healthy ecosystem. So what we do to our environment matters. And it matters because our environment is where we get the food that we feed to our ecosystem. And underlying that entire process is soil health. So every farmer who, every small farmer, corporate farmers, are not really people, they are businesses, but a farmer who cares about the soil cares about quality. They care about the health of their environment. They understand that the soil is the basis for food production and that that basis has to be maintained into the future or you lose your capacity for food production. But more than that, the health of the soil is a difficult thing because it's also an ecosystem. So there is this underground ecosystem and it underlines every aspect of our world. And the reason I say that is because we tend to eat plants and plants grow in soil and the plants can't grow normally in a healthy manner without a healthy soil environment. When we add fertilizer, we kill that soil environment. When we add herbicides and pesticides, we damage that environment. When we plow, we kill that environment. So we have to understand what it is that makes healthy soil so that we can make healthy plants. The healthy plants are food for literally everything else. The insects, the birds, the, us, animals that eat plants, and then we might eat those animals. So there is this structure to the world that, as far as we're concerned, ends with us. And everything below us in that structure needs to be healthy if we are going to be healthy. So ultimately, uh, what I'm hoping to focus on in my own work is what it means to live in a world that is healthy for a human being. It has to be a world where human beings care about the world, particularly the soil in the world, but everything that is emerging from that. And so uh, what we are doing to soil today is in my mind highly immoral. We are destroying our world in order to gain 
short-term success when we should be focusing on what we want not our children or our grandchildren to be experiencing, but people 100 years from now. Is there going to be a world for them? And the answer is, if we don't take care of the soil, I'm not sure about that. I, I know all these this conversation and arguments and this and that about organic and sustainable. And this, I think we need to understand the, the sort of the principles that underlie this. There are evolutionary biology principles. There are systems ecology principles, the, the things that, that, that govern life of a group of organisms, not this one species and that one species, this one species. Uh, we're either part of this system or we're destroying the system, and I don't think there's two ways around that. The soil scientists I've talked to, and there are some nearby who are really, really, oh, um, rabid about <laughs> soil health, <laughs> uh, looking for converts. Um, they have not only claimed, but have demonstrated that they can take that awful gray, pale brown, ruined farm soil and they can turn it into rich brown forest soil in two years. Two years. I said one year and they, no, no, two years. Give us two years, we can do this. The first year won't be quite ready. And they do that by no-till farming. They add a multi-species cover crop. So there's not just one species or two species, 12 species of things growing. There's, there's nitrogen-fixing plants, deep-rooted plants, tap-rooted plants, there's grasses. All of this stuff grows in the wintertime when you're not growing crops. And then it dies in hot weather. So you plant winter stuff and it covers the soil so there's no rain. Snow can't get to the soil. The sun can't get to the soil. The soil is protected um, and it stays in place. And then immediately worms move in and bacteria and fungi and spiders and all the creepy crawlies out there move in. And there's a little world out there within one year. The roots go down in the soil and add carbon and nitrogen and structure and air spaces and start to bring back the pores in the soil and uncompact the soil. That's why the big rooted things are so important. Um, and then of the utmost important is that the next year the farmer does not plow it, but just flatten it. Just pull a, a big roller over it, flatten it down, and then drill the seeds for your crop into that. Leave it there because all the spiders are there and all the worms are there. Don't disturb them. They're doing their job. That first year may not be the best year, but by the second year, they have shown that they don't need pesticides or fertilizers anymore, and they're getting crop yields just as good as the guys who are and at a lower cost because they're not spending all their money on driving tractors and diesel fuel and pesticides and herbicides. Um, and they, you look at the soil and you go, that's amazing. It's amazing that they can transform the soil. Now getting a farmer to buy into that is the biggest problem they have, but they're demonstrating it. Two points there. If you don't do that, you have incredible erosion problems. And so anything that's on the field, they, <clears throat> some fields can lose 40% of their topsoil in just a couple of years if it rains hard, it just runs right off into rivers, which is why they're now dead zones in you know, the Gulf of Mexico um, and Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> and when cover crops are used, there's almost zero runoff. So that means any chemicals used, yes, would stay in place. But the second part of that is, if you get a bacterial community going again in that soil, bacteria can do anything. And I mean anything. There's nothing bacteria can't do. If there is a source of carbon in the soil that nothing else is using, there will be a bacterium that adapts to use that carbon. And these pesticides and herbicides, in many cases, they are carbon-based, they're organic molecules. If you have an organic molecule um, um, that has carbon in it, there's going to be a bacteria that'll eat it. And so they'll break the stuff down pretty quickly. Now, if you've used, like you've got a toxic dump out there, that's a little bit different problem, but that's not most uh, farming situations. Um, that takes a while. <clears throat> but in a normal situation with fertilizers, which break down very quickly anyway, so it would be, it would be chemicals. Um, pesticides that we'd be most concerned with. Um, 
The residual lifespan of those chemicals can be fairly long, but if you brought in a healthy soil community between fungi and bacteria, I am certain that they would eliminate those problems in a very short amount of time. This is a, this is a, a system, an ecosystem that's been hugely damaged. And so the farm soils are incapable of doing this on their own and they're not being, being given the opportunity anyway. So given the opportunity to reestablish a below ground community, things just sort of start taking care of themselves. This is nature at work. Most small to medium farmers would say, if you can show me how to do this, I'll do this. If you can promise me I will save money, I'll do this. And so that's how they're selling soil conservation is, oh yeah, we can get you out of the herbicide business, we can get you out of the insecticide business, and they're like, sign me up, show me how to do this. <clears throat> It'll take two years, but we promise you, your yields will be just as good as the neighbors, but you won't have the costs. So the bottom line goes up. If you can talk that language to the farmers, they're all ears. Because they really don't like doing all this damage to their soil. It's the big, the big commercial prod, product, um, you know, production companies, the corporations that own farmland are, and are beholden to shareholders, for instance. Get that stuff out of the ground. It's sort of like cutting down trees in the forest. It's, until you cut those trees, they're not worth a thing. Standing out there in the woods, they're not worth a dime. And so <clears throat> the corporate approach is, you cut them down, you turn them into cash, that is good for us. So if you can get a regular farmer to a situation where he's saving money by not doing this thing that he really doesn't like anyway, like they don't like chemicals all that much. If they can get out of it, they would get out of it, but they feel like they're stuck. would have to be convinced there was a reason that that would bring in more money for shareholders, but it's the agrochemical companies, the biotech companies that are, um, I'm not sure they would see where their upside is for them. Like how do we monetize uh, health of the soil? I can sell you more fertilizers. We can continue to grow food on completely dead soil. In fact, we could go to greenhouses. You don't even need soil. We can do that too, we'll help you. We'll help you build the greenhouses. They only cost a few million dollars, but you'll probably get that money back in the long run. I mean, they will think of ways where technology, something they can sell to you, should be preferable to this, this sort of all natural you know, approach that they don't have a way to monetize. So it's, <clears throat> it's not, it's, it's big ag in the sense that it's the, the agrochemical biotech world that's driving this because um, it's sort of like you know those companies that own lots and lots of fossil fuels and they don't think solar energy and wind energy is the well if I were them I would diversify <laughs> there's a lot of money in wind and solar <laughs> as some of them are now finding out and I think the ones that are that are so, so push, push, push to keep us in coal and, and oil are because they, aren't, they haven't diversified into any other forms of energy. But if big ag would do that, we might see a little bit more movement in that direction. I think farming has become a recipe because we think that <clears throat> the biology is not necessary to make food. Um, it, we, we can deal with this problem in a technological way. So really, I mean, what does a plant do? You take some seeds and you put them in the ground and you give them some water and some fertilizer and some sunlight and a little bit of time and then there they are. This, it doesn't matter whether the soil is healthy or not, you can put fertilizer on there, keep the water going, uh, give them lots of sunlight, plants just grow. Um, and so we, we are treating this very biological process as a somewhat technological process. It's just a recipe for making food, right? Um, <clears throat> and that mindset completely ignores the, 
the interactions that the plant not only endures but enjoys with the surrounding environment. And there are a number of interactions that are absolutely necessary. Pollinators are necessary. There are a number of interactions that are not necessary, it would seem, like uh, an insect eating the leaves on the plant. But the thing is, plants are adapted to those insects. They have an answer for them. And that answer is typically they can produce, if not toxins, at least flavors, something that dissuade those insects from eating them. But they don't produce those compounds unless they've been attacked. Now, it turns out that a number of those compounds may also contribute to the flavor of, of plants. And I say may, no, they do. Every flavor in a plant is a compound in the plant that is not necessary for growing. What's necessary is protein and chlorophyll and DNA and RNA and all of those things. That's what's necessary. The chemicals that run the plant. But all of these other things, smells and flavors and tastes and toxins, these are all chemicals the plant has made as it has adapted to its world. Almost all of them, if not all of them, are toxic to something that tried to eat them. And so <clears throat> we, when we turn growing food into a recipe for just do this, this, and this, a series of steps, we're completely ignoring the fact that the plant interacts with the environment in, in innumerable ways. And those interactions contribute to the flavor and the quality and the nuance uh, of the plant. When we grow plants in a completely stress-free environment, we get unstressed plants that don't produce particularly good food or maybe not quite the same quality or maybe not quite the same taste because they never had to do the things that plants have to do to live in the world. And so they're sort of simplified versions of themselves because they've been grown in a simplified world under no stress and maybe in a tent, a greenhouse uh, controlled environment. And so um, we don't know that most of the time is probably the biggest problem. We don't realize just how much food that we eat comes from these sorts of factory style conditions. And it's a great deal of the fresh produce that we're eating today. All the leafy green stuff, for instance, all the tomatoes, uh, more and more, anything that's an annual crop is being grown indoors, away from the world, and away from the world that, that created that plant and causes that plant to be what it is. The farmer in 1944, and I chose that date because it's about the end of World War II, before really the world of pesticides and insecticides and, and fertilizers came into being. Um, so we choose that date and say, okay, let's fast forward 60, 70 years to now. Um, <clears throat> what was different then? Well, farming was fairly close to the traditional style. It was expanding. We were going to larger and larger expanses. The Dust Bowl era proves to us that we certainly had the capacity to damage the land in a very big way. Um, some of that our fault, and some of it just, that's just the way the weather happened to turn out for several years in a row and caused the problem. But the farmer was less capable of doing the kinds of damage we do now. The farmers were plagued with pests. Cotton farmers cried out to Congress that they didn't know what to do with the boll weevil and, and a couple of other cotton plants and what could, what, we need something. And that was the response in 1947 was DDT. And like I say, many farmers were delighted with that response because it seemed to be salvation. If we fast forward, oh, and by the way, uh, crop losses on average in the 1940s was, uh, has been estimated at about one third. So about a third of the crop was lost from, <clears throat> from, from the field to the marketplace one way or another. It wasn't always pests, it was just other ways of, it could be shipping, it could be handling, it could be other ways. But about a third of the crop was lost <clears throat> from the field to the marketplace. If we fast forward to uh, 70 years later, uh, we've done massive damage to, the, to the, uh, our land, our soil, uh, ecosystems, 
uh, species of naturally occurring plants and animals disappeared. Um, we've been over that, but the really, really important message is that the promise of chemicals, the promise of technology was we can, we can save you from nature. We can protect your crops and help you get those crops to market. And if this one fails, we'll make another one and it will do the job and we're going to solve this problem. In 2014, 70 years later, the average losses in crops was about one third. The difference was that farmers are now absolutely addicted to the use of pesticides and fertilizers and their expenses are much higher. Now, we do, I will admit, that what we can get out of an acre of land is also much higher. So yields are higher. In fact, they're about six times higher in corn um, and so the kind of losses we took back then, we can't possibly take today. Um, if 30% of, of the losses then and 30% of the losses today, that's a lot of money. Um, so the problem is that the promise of technology has not been borne out. It's not there. Uh, even if we had dropped the losses 5%, so we're only losing 25 to 27%, really? That's all we got out of 70 years of chemical use? I think we have to admit at this point that that little experiment was a failure. Yeah, we and the rest of the world are, are committed to using chemicals. Um, and the, that number, $40 billion, is growing fast. And you could also ask then, can we really sustain that? If we've gone from zero, well not zero, but very low costs of agrochemicals 70 years ago to $40 billion, and we're still losing crops at essentially the same rate we lost crops 70 years ago, can we really afford to do that given the amount of damage that $40 billion worth of chemicals will do to the environment? I think the answer is pretty clearly no, we cannot. That is not sustainable in any sense of the word. Nothing about that is sustainable. So <sighs> that number is staggering. The majority, I think it's 23 billion, is used in the United States of that 40 billion. 23 billion for us, we are 5% of the world's population, and 17 billion for the other 7.2 billion people in the world. Um, one would think that maybe they're doing better than we are because they certainly aren't using the chemicals at the same rate we are. But it hasn't, we are the, I don't know if we, you'd call us the leader of the agri agriculture industry, but for, for a country that, that claims the high ground on technology and development and breakthroughs, I don't see us really leading to any future that is brighter than the one we had before. So um, we got here on, uh, we're that snowball rolling downhill. We're gaining speed, we're getting bigger and bigger, and we have no clue what's at the bottom of the hill. We just don't know, or how far away the bottom of that hill is. It could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years from now, but it is coming. I don't, think there, I don't think there's any way you could look at that math and not arrive at that conclusion. I don't really have a question, uh, an answer to why cotton consumes more chemicals than any other crop, and by far. But I will give you an example of what the problem is like with cotton. In, 19, in the ni late 1940s, there were three primary uh, crop pests. There was the boll weevil, there was a, a boll worm, and there was a leaf worm. And they were devastating cotton crops in the South. Um, and I think the, the, the state where it was hit the hardest was Alabama. And uh, when DDT was introduced, it was a game changer. It absolutely devastated the populations of those three pests, but only for about mm, five years. And then the pests were back, and now they were re growing resistance in them. The problem was this, that when those three came back, five others came with them. So there weren't three pests after five, six, seven years. There were eight pests. 
<clears throat> Today there are 33, at least 33 different pests on cotton. Some of them are just, we don't even talk about the species, we just talk about the genus because there might be three or four species within a particular genus like leafhoppers and, and, and some other things like that, thrips and mites and um, some of the really small things. So we went from, by applying chemicals, we went from three pests to 33 pests. Now, by the way, the emergence of those, those next five was because by applying DDT, we killed off all the predators in the field. All the spiders were gone, all the ladybugs, lacewings, grass, anything else that was going to eat, eat, but they were gone. And so any pests that had been suppressed by predators no longer were suppressed. The only thing in those fields now was things that eat cotton. And so they all realized that there were, there were no controls anymore. All the controls had been eliminated by DDT. And if there's one thing that, that, that chemicals do probably the greatest damage to an environment doing, it's that, by eliminating beneficial insects. And that just opens the floodgates for the pests. So here we get into this situation where we have to start applying even more chemicals because now there's eight pests and we apply more chemicals and we, we hammer those pests and we, we try to just go after them. And the only thing that happens is we lose another chemical because of resistance and we gain more pests. And so here we are decades later, 10 times as many pests we're using a quarter of all the pesticides used in, and that's herbicides as well as insecticides, uh, in America. And we have absolutely not conquered the problem. We haven't even come, we've made it far worse than it ever was. We poured gasoline on that fire. And that's why cotton, let's, I don't know why cotton itself uses that many, because this could happen in a number of other crops. But uh, I mean, lettuce, for example, lettuce is tremendously, uh, consumptive in terms of chemicals, except we don't grow that much lettuce. We grow lots and lots of cotton. You're just throwing gas on the fire. Well, uh, almost immediately, you can't even draw the line. It's like, here's DDT. Okay, we got you. You're hooked. I mean, we just gave you heroin, and now you're an addict. So, and uh, by the way, we've got more, so anytime you want more, just come see us. Yeah, it'll take some money, however. You might want to go to the bank before you come see us. Ninety-five percent of the corn in the U.S. is what's called dent corn or field corn. Um, and it's called field corn in, for, as commodity traders refer to it as field corn. Um, it's called dent corn because that's what it looks like when it dries out. It's got a little dent in the end of it. Um, <clears throat> we don't eat that corn. That's field corn. If you're a deer hunter, you can feed it to deer, right? Uh, it's the corn that's made into all corn products. So if we're making ethanol, we make it from field corn. If we're feeding it to a livestock, we're using field corn. Humans don't eat this corn um, directly. We eat it as corn derivatives. So high fructose corn syrup is from dent corn, and that's how we consume it as in other ways. It's interesting that 95% of all the corn that we grow is not corn that we actually eat, but we've also gotten so that um, we have very little variation in that corn. So here's the thing with genetically modified crops. The biotech companies will invest in a crop if it's a crop that can be sold at a very large scale for a lot of money because it's going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to make this, this crop, this product of theirs that they have a patent on and they want to be able to sell it to a large number of growers and make that money back. So they're expecting by putting in $200 million into a new product, they're gonna get a billion dollars in return. That's not going to happen with okra. It's not going to happen with raspberries. Um, but it will happen with, and, and also you can't store raspberries. You have to sell them immediately, but you can store corn, it's a commodity. So they're willing to put lots of money into this. Now the thing about that then is that every genetically modified strain of corn is a single genotype, one genotype. That's what was patented, the genotype, because the gene is in that particular 
germline, and that's what was patented. And so every farmer that uses that product is planting a field that has one individual in it, just one, one genetic individual. There are 10 million of them out there, but there's just one. The real problem with this is, um, and the reason I'm sort of terrified of the idea of bioterrorism, is that if a disease comes along that affects that genotype, you lose every single plant, every plant. If you grow into a field of corn right now, there is one plant out there because it's a clone of every other plant out there. And there's no genetic variation. And the essence of a species is genetic variation. The ability of any species to adapt to its environment is genetic variation. If there is no genetic variation, there is no possibility of ever adapting again. And so, and this is on purpose. I mean, um, that's the way they want it. Now, if you think about corn, it's of uniform height. It's of uniform quality. It ripens at all exactly the same time. It grows at exactly the same rate. The, the ears of corn are this high and this high off the ground. The harvester gets them all at one pass. Perfect. It, it, it's a great, very efficient way to grow corn. But it is probably the most fragile system that you can imagine. It is ready, just waiting to be, begging to be disrupted by nature. And, na and as we are now seeing with, for anyone who keeps track of the news on bananas, the Cavendish banana is facing a fungus that it cannot resist. And if they don't do something, we'll lose Cavendish banana. Why? There is one genotype of banana out there in the Cavendish world, there is one. Every Cavendish banana in this world was derived from one plant. There's no genetic variation. There is no hope of saving that banana from eventually nature. And that's true of using crops that essentially have no genetic variation. They are, they are unprotected from the world around them without our help, I guess. That is the worst part about the, the Supreme Court decision to allow patenting of, of life, was that you, you're not patenting the species, you're patenting that. And you're only going to sell that. There's, that seems on one hand, oh, well, so you didn't patent it at all, you just have that. Well, that's okay, you just have that. Well, yes, but that means for a big, big corporation, I'm going to have every single farmer in this whole area growing that. That's how they know, that's how Monsanto knows if some farmer's growing their seeds, all they gotta do is go, oh, there it is, you got it, it's in your field, therefore you're stealing from us. I mean, that's the whole, that's how they can do that. It's like they have, they've got a little stamp, and they're going, you got the stamp on the, like, you ever see Blade Runner? When he, when he found the little scale of the snake, he took it to someone with a microscope and went, oh yeah, so-and-so made this scale, because every scale on the snake had a, a, a UPC code on it, basically. Same thing. That's what genetic barcoding is. We, we can, tr essentially, it's like forensic farming. You can trace every single seed out there now because it's got a, a genetic stamp on it. Agriculture simplifies complex systems. In fact, a, uh, um, probably uh, the happiest uh, uh, farm company can be is when there is one species in a field and that's it. Their species, their crop, and that's it. So that's the most simplified you can get. If we look at a natural system, there is any number of plants, any number of things eating the plants, and there are things eating the things that eat the plants. We've got the entire food chain and then the food web in there. It's very complex. There's redundancy at every level. Do we need that many plants? Well, each plant's doing something slightly different. Do we need that many insects? Well, each insect is doing something slightly different. They all have a role, they all have a niche. Um, and it's all balanced. No one is dominating, no one is gaining control. The others. Some are specialists, some are generalists. No one can really control the entire resource, and so we get this complex, highly adjustable, highly flexible, very stable system because no one species can take over. When we start to simplify that system, we start eliminating species here and there, 
we reduce the number of plants down to one or two or three, just a few, we reduce the number of insects that can eat those plants. The others, we're eating other plants, or they can't compete with the ones that are still there. So some insects are better. They're specialists. You can't kick a specialist off a plant because they're better at it than anybody else. So we get what we get on our crop plants are there's a, a, one species in particular that eats roots. There's one in particular that really goes after seeds. There's one that goes after flower buds. They all have little specialties. <clears throat> As we simplify our agroecosystems, our farming ecosystems, down to one or a few species, we're going to simplify the number of pests down to those species that are truly specialists on those plants. And we're going to go after them with chemicals, and they're going to adapt to those chemicals. And they're going to get better and better at preserving their role in that environment. They're going to become tighter and tighter, uh, more connected to that niche. And we're going to find that, and I'll give you an example, species like the green peach aphid. The green peach aphid obviously comes from peach trees. Uh, and it, it gets on the underside of leaves and they roll up and they wilt and it doesn't do very well. We've gone after the green peach aphid for decades with everything we've got. It is now resistant to over 75 different chemicals. <clears throat> it is the smallest, squishiest, softest, least protected little bug you'll ever see. You can smash 50 of them with your thumb. And yet we can't beat that bug. There's nothing we can do to beat that bug. And it is now on 50 different crop plants. It's on everything from cut flowers to broccoli. It's on weeds. It's on everything. We have allowed it to take over um, our fields by continually going after it with pesticides. So in this case, it's a very generalist species. But when it's on a particular plant, it's almost a specialist species. At any rate, what we're doing is we're forcing out all other insects, and we are creating a haven for those insects that can adapt to our technology. And essentially, they have the complete run of the field. There's nothing there that can challenge them. There's, they have no predators. There's no chemical that can beat them. And we keep providing food for them. We grow monocultures, vast monocultures of plants that they love to eat, and there's not one predator out there that's going to stop them from doing that. They have no competitors either. And so, <laughs> as we convert the world to a much more simplified agricultural ecosystem, those species that can come along for that ride are winning the lottery. They are being handed the keys to the kingdom. They can tolerate everything we throw at them. They get along with us. They get along with the human world. They, they, um, they are well suited to the way we do things, and we're handing them um, tremendous success. And it's because we, of our insistence on this approach toward agriculture. The green peach aphid is not going to be a problem if there are 20 different crops being grown on 100 acres, and there's nearby forest land or brush land that, harvest, that um, harbors birds and insects and wasps and bees and, and all of those other things that can come in and, and find food, insects, that they're interested in, the green peach aphid is not a problem. Um, the rest of the world will catch up with it. But if we keep this very simplistic approach, this technological approach toward producing our food, we're inviting the worst of the worst to come along with us on that ride. We're growing this giant bowl of lettuce out there. <laughs> and insects are going, I like lettuce. And there's nothing we can do about it because we made that bowl of lettuce. So that's what a monoculture is, and that's why it's such a bad thing. And then add on top of that, let's get rid of all genetic variation whatsoever. I would love to talk, uh, I mean, I, ha I did in my book, but just this guy in 1951 at Kansas State who said, he wrote a book called Pest Resistance in Crop Plants. He didn't mean that the pests were resistant in the crop plants. He meant the crop plants were resistant to the pests, but only if you had a lot of genetic variation in the field, right? So that, oh, they might get that plant and that plant and that plant, but well, they didn't get the rest of the plants because the plants have their own level of resistance. And he said, we need to focus on this. 
So instead, we went in the exact opposite direction, said, no, let's eliminate genetic variation, and we'll just deal with it with chemicals. And he was saying, we don't have to deal with it. These plants are capable of defending themselves. We need to work with that. We didn't. It was 1951, yeah. He, he was already seeing the effects of chemicals. He was looking at DDT and going, oh, that's interesting. Sometimes the insects die here and they don't. Oh. He was also noticing that the insects that ate certain plants didn't die and some that ate other plants. Like It depended on what plants they were eating. The plants were actually giving them resistance. So there was a little aspect of that. But it was this, he was talking about this dynamic interaction between you know, the, 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 the herbivore and its food. And he thought we really needed to you know, work on that. That was very important. No. Skip that, move on. I mean, I've touched on that quite a bit. It's about diversity. It's about having that ecosystem there, the, the structure. I mean, we could, we could say, oh, you know, integrated pest management, but I, I, and that's where most farm advisors have gone. go, well, you need, you've got a lot of tools. You need to use all your tools. And I don't think that's the answer at all. I think the answer is more along the lines of the soil scientists go, start at the bottom. Let's build an ecosystem. You know, problem. You don't need to worry about because even the the IPM people will say, well, you know, if it all if it comes to it, you got to use chemicals. You go, I don't think that should be a solution ever. But when I got the invitation to to speak at the the Real Truth About Health conference. Um, I was a little skeptical because I had never heard of it before, and I, I wanted to be sure that that I wasn't um, I wasn't being invited just because I'm sort of anti-establishment. At least that's the way my writings might appear, and that and that it would fit in to the general conversation. And um, Steve Shore, the organizer, assured me that, you know, uh, don't worry about that. I'm going to put together a panel of people and you will be speaking the same language. You'll be talking about um, shared interests. Um, and when I saw the names of the people he'd invited, I said, oh, yes, definitely. I think I, I, think I should do this. I mean, it's not just to, um, I absolutely want to get what I've been writing about out into the broader public. Um, but there it depends on where you look, whether or not you're going to see my book. Um, it tends to be more on the science side of things. And I think I tried to write it to be accessible to literally anybody. Uh, I tried to write it at the non-scientist level. So the, the opportunity to introduce it to people that I might not have been able to reach, and also to spend some time talking with other people who've been writing on similar subjects, um, was very attractive. I, I thought, no, oh, this is something I definitely can do. Um, a little bit of a commitment because it comes right in the middle of the semester and I should be teaching classes right now, but I think it's important um, to contribute to um, conferences like this and efforts like this because what I hear being said at this conference is not part of the general conversation when we talk about food and health and agriculture and genetically modified organisms and other problems that we encounter in our society. So a lot of these things are swept under the rug and, and people might claim, well, that's not important or that's not real or we don't need to worry about that. But um, when you consider all of the things that we are doing to our world and our environment that have a negative effect on our health as humans and as a species and as a world, I think it's important to bring these different elements together and see what kind of common ground there is among all of the people who are interested and maybe work on that in the future. Mm -hmm.